in your own words. Thanks very much, Liam, for doing this, and hopefully we get on pretty well here now. <laughs> we will. Uh, before we get started, how have you been doing after the last two years? Good, good. Um, I'm in a really happy place now. Mm. Well, in a really happy place now. I have been happy all the way through the process. Um, there have been difficult points of it, yeah. But, but yeah, life is good. Life is great. Good, good. We'll get on to what you're doing now for the future later on. Sure. Uh, I want to take you back, Stephen, to your childhood. Okay. Growing up in Tala. Sure. You can go from teenage or you can go before that. What was um, it like for you? My childhood in Tala was... It was... It was difficult in parts. Yeah. Um, I remember I enjoyed the, it for the most part, mm. but it was hard. I mean, when I was 12, just before I was a teenager, our family unit that had been my mum, my yeah, dad, yeah, and my yeah. two siblings, um, my, my brother Gary and my sister Lisa, yeah. was, was changed forever when my dad left. Yeah. So I was 12, the oldest boy in the house, yeah, and nice. when my dad left, and although it wasn't a clean break, he kept coming back and it was quite traumatic actually on the family. It was messy, yeah. it was messy and I found I had to become the, the man of the house. Yes. And that, that was tough for, for a 12 year old. Looking back, it was tough. Yes. I, I think looking back, I learned a lot okay. and I, I certainly learned some coping skills that helped me with yeah. my recent um, yeah, yeah, yeah. difficulties in terms of, of my cancer diagnosis. Yeah. So in a way, I'm thankful for that. It, but it wasn't easy. Yeah. Uh, my mum worked really hard. She she made sure that we had a, a really lovely, yeah. uh, as good of a childhood as we could That's have. Possible, yeah. um, but it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. But would I take any of it back? No. I I love growing up in Tala. I love the people mm. who live in Tala are amazing. I still have a lot of friends who mm. who still live there but grew up there. I. Yeah. Look, it, it wasn't easy, but it was was my childhood, and I wouldn't change it for the world. And what would your favourite memories be as a childhood? Oh god, I have so many of them. Um, I used to spend a lot of the summer times in Hollywood. Funnily enough, Hollywood and Wicklow. Uh, I spend a lot of my summer times now in Hollywood and LA for, for different reasons. But my cousins lived in Hollywood and Wicklow, so I would go down for two or three months of the summer, and I loved that. Um, I loved, I loved my my friends that I grew up with, with and and playing chasing as a kid in Tottenham Park and yeah. running around, we call it Vietnam. I mean, <laughs> let's go down to Nam and um, play yeah, chasing yeah. and I'm just hanging around. Yeah. I, I used to hang around with, with my mates and, and I loved it. And, and there's some of them that are still in my life and I'm, yeah. I'm really thankful for that because they're really good people. Okay. Um, can I ask you about being gay in Thailand? Yeah. Um, Did you find that difficult when you finally came out and stuff like that? My coming out story was was difficult. Um, there was a bit of trauma. Would that be because the, your father left and you were the man of the house and you didn't? Or what was it? I don't know. I don't know. It's a, it, it's a it's a big answer and it's quite broad, I suppose. When I when I was comfortable enough to talk about it, I spoke to a friend of mine. Um, Jess, who's still a good friend of mine. Yeah. I. It's the first time I've spoken about this, so it's. So it's. I'm, yeah. I'm just. Uh, I said it's gonna surprise you. Yeah, no, and, and it's fine. And I'm just um, formulating my answer. But I'm not formulating, but I just want to think get it bit clear. Bit. Yeah. Um, my sister found it difficult. Okay. She was the second person, or at least one of the second, uh, or one of the, the first the few group. people yeah, that yeah, I told. Okay. She had a hard time with it, and the reason I'm having a hard time with this now is because she and I get on really well now, and we were the best of friends. But so I don't want her to sound like she had she did have an issue with it, and you don't want that to seem that it affected you in your decision. Is it? it? It was tough. Look, it was tough. Um, a lot of my friends were fine with it. Most of them were. I. I I had a relatively okay coming out. But that's what um, I was going to ask you next. Did anyone treat you different when you finally did come out? I've been incredibly lucky with. Them. Right. I say my friends and my family and my aunts and my uncles and my cousins. My sister had an issue with it. Um, she doesn't anymore, yes. but she did, and, and I just have to be honest in that. Um, people in Tallinn know. Um, 
I was I was older though when I came out, so I was 18, 19, I started going to, yeah, I, th I think I was, or maybe I was 17, um, and I started to go to college at that point, and then I travelled around for a while, and then I came home, and I wasn't really in Tala as much as I had been when I was a younger teenager, so I wasn't 15, 16, and... I had a few years of still going to school, school and, and having to deal with that. Aspect. You know, I didn't yeah. have that, so I guess it was easier for me in a way because I wasn't there as much as I had been. Oh. So I want to get onto your art. Okay. When did you uh, realise you were actually good at art? Well, this is something I talk about quite a bit, and how art and creativity definitely saved my life, and, and yeah. I think it could, it can have a really positive impact on everyone's life. Yeah. So, I was always drawing from when I was a kid. I remember when my dad was still around and we went on a family holiday to a, a, maybe it was somewhere like Kerry, it was a, a small house in somewhere down the country. And there was a picture on the wall and I redrew the picture and I remember that incredibly well. I remember the picture and it was of a cottage and there was flowers in the garden and I coloured it in and it was very similar, at least I thought back then, it was yeah, almost yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a carbon copy. Um, if I saw it now, of course, I, I it probably laugh. Be, you know, well, I don't think I'd laugh, but because it is part of, of my of your journey, yeah, my, my yeah. training, and, and art can be taught, and, and creativity can be. You have it innately, and every one of us does. But you can learn how to draw. Um, so it was just part of the practice yeah. all the way through, um, and I'd love to see it actually, uh, to be honest. But. Throughout my years of growing up, uh, even when my dad was in the house, give him a bit of credit, he he and my mum made sure that we, I always had the, the materials that were needed. that I needed. Yeah. Um, and then when he left, my mum always made sure that I had the paints and the pencils. And when I when I couldn't um, afford them, um, yeah. when I wasn't working, I was yeah. 12, 13. Yeah. Now I did start working at 13. Um, 13 going on 14, um, and the place I started working in, I was 14. They thought I was 14 going on 15, but and then as I started to make my own money, two pound 15 an hour, I I was able to buy my own materials. But art has always been a part of my life all the way through, and always will be going forward. I, I know that, and as I said said at the start of the, of the answer to the question. Creativity is, is, we're creative beings, yeah. it's inside all of us, and we need to nurture that. There's an there's a author and a, a, a speaker in America called Brene Brown, and she talks about creativity, and unused creativity is not benign. It actually metastasizes, yeah. so it's malignant. If you don't use yeah. it, it can be damaging. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I definitely recommend people out there, if, even if they don't want to be a J.K. Rowling, or they don't want to be a W.B. Yeats, or they don't want to be a Picasso, yeah. Spend some time just creating and being yourself and, and taking time to yourself and doodling or write that um, play that you want to write or write that yeah. story. It doesn't have to be for anybody else. It's for you and it's expressing yourself. I think art and creativity are incredibly important. And do you have a favourite uh, drawing or art piece you've done? That I've done? Wow. Um, <laughs> There's one that, I do have one stand out. That you're like, yeah, that's like the first one you saw, or the one you're walking on now. I kind of love them all, to be honest. Okay. I, in in my own way, certainly my abstract pieces, because yeah. my abstract work and my work has become a lot more abstract in the recent um, past or more recently. Um, the abstract work speaks to me much more than the photorealistic work or the more fine yeah. line work, because the fine line work is much more rigid, and, and also with on painting a, a dog, it has to look like a dog. Yeah, I love them though. I, I love them as well, I love them as well. But the place I have been in recently in terms of, of my energy and, and yeah. my, my belief system has changed as well and, and that has, has influenced my art yeah. and that's uh, me expressing myself on, on canvas is, is probably then influencing my life so it's kind of a circular thing. So some of the new work I really love, and it, it's always kind of the newest painting is, is my favorite. Baby, it's, yeah. like, it's like it's the new baby, baby, you know. Yeah, you exactly. forget about the other ones. Yeah. Um, so I like them all. I love them all. Wait, well, yeah, I want to get into the last two years. Okay. I know you've talked about it on television and all. Mm -hmm. People who haven't seen it, sure. could you give them a rundown of what happened? Absolutely. So September 11th. Okay, we all know, or have a memory of September 11th. Yeah. Um, I have a memory of September 11th, and I had one before my, my latest um, yeah. memory. 
On September 11th, 2017, my life changed completely. On September 11th, 2017, like that, my world fell apart. And I'm sitting here today, I'm very thankful and grateful for, for my life and where I live and, and the people I have in my life. But it hasn't been easy. Yeah. On that day, I was diagnosed with stage one at that point, metastatic melanoma. Well, stage one melanoma, actually. It wasn't metastatic, or yeah. it was, but we didn't know at that point. So I was diagnosed with, with melanoma, which is the deadliest form of skin cancer. Yeah. Um, uh, over a thousand people every year in Ireland are diagnosed with it. Yeah. So few people know what the signs and symptoms are. Uh, actually, I have no symptoms of it. I had some signs, but uh, yeah. a mole on my lower back had changed. Yeah. Flash forward to so September 11th is a is a pretty ominous day, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flash forward a few weeks, and we are October 13th, which is a Friday. Friday the 13th. Lucky day. It hadn't been for me in the past. Yeah. It turns out that it. Well, unlucky, I don't know. Look, no one wants a cancer diagnosis. Yeah, 100%. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. What yeah. I've gone through, what my family and friends have gone through in the last almost two years has been absolute hell. I've, I've lived in, at points I've lived in hell. But unlucky, I don't know. Because I've learned so much from it. Yeah. Um, from my cancer diagnosis. On Friday the 13th, I was diagnosed stage three metastatic melanoma. So they'd found melanoma in my lymph nodes, which is not a good place for it to be, so no. the travel. So that led me on to more surgeries. Stage four is the latest stage of melanoma, and it's a terminal stage. There's, there's no cure. There's no cure for melanoma at, at stage four. At stage three, the, the only option that we have really in Ireland is surgery. And that is 50% of the time that cures you, 50% of the time it doesn't. So I could have a rogue melanoma cell floating around my body, who knows. I don't worry about it, I don't worry about much. Um, I certainly don't worry about melanoma. I am aware of, of the situation, I'm aware of the seriousness of the situation. When I'm talking about it, I always like to say, because I talk about it in such a positive frame. Yeah. Because, and again, back to unlucky, I don't think it was unlucky actually, yeah. I think it was I think it, it has inspired me and motivated me like nothing else in my life has. Yeah. I'm doing so much more now that I would have probably never done. Yeah. I potentially would have lived a life for ho however many years of complacency and just coasting. And I had an amazing career with art. Yeah. I was selling all over the world. I was selling to film stars and rock stars and politicians and um, um, people from, uh, from every, every background, of course, that are important to me, anyone who buys my work. But I was, I was doing incredibly well. I had my first show in LA that was that happened, but I couldn't be there because of my surgery. Yes. But since my diagnosis, I've been I'm driven to to yeah, succeed. Ex share my story. I'm yeah. talking about my childhood. I never did that before. In ten years of being interviewed, I never spoke about yeah. my background and where I was from. Yeah. Um, so so sorry. I'm, I've I've come away from from the process of, of what happened, and, and we were on Friday the 13th in, in 2007. What happened after that was, I already had a surgery called a wide local excision, so they took about that much okay. um, from my back, the scars about that size from my back, which is where the original cancer cell was, okay. um, or the mole, and the reason for that is they wanted to check that there was no cancer cells in the surrounding skin. Okay. Yeah. Luckily enough, there wasn't, but because the sentinel lymph nodes yeah. came back as having a cancer load, I, I had to have a... It was an option of having a groin dissection, so all the lymph nodes out of my left groin, yeah. or watch and wait and scan. And I did not want to watch and wait. I wanted it gone. I would have had my leg off if it meant saving my life because I love my life. I, yeah. Even now, I, I even more now actually. So, so I had another surgery then within a week or two of the surgery on my back, and then I I was at home recovering and I got sepsis. And then I, I was discharged from hospital after my sepsis is, is septic, well it's blood poisoning, it's, it's a killer. Yeah. And it kills so many people every year. I think it's very unknown. It's very sepsis. unknown, people don't, don't, don't know, really. I didn't know. Yeah. Um, I was discharged from hospital after my first time with sepsis, yeah. it wasn't that serious. And I had to go back in through a &E for a second time with sepsis, and it was kept in longer. Mm. That was just before Christmas. It was November of 2017. 
And while I was in the hospital, I was attached to monitors on the wall, and I was attached to, and you know, I find myself, and we all do it, Irish people do it, that we find ourselves ranking, um, ranking our illnesses, and you know, I would say, you know, it was only sepsis, I was only attached to the wall, someone else was sicker, but we shouldn't do that, we should absolutely acknowledge, and I find myself doing it, or used to, we should acknowledge that we are, we're not well, and it's okay to say, you know what, this is shit. Yeah. I'm not feeling well. I'm in a really bad way at the moment. Yes, there are. We all know there are other people who are doing worse. But it's okay for me to say, even if I have the flu, it's okay to say, you know, I feel like crap. Yeah. And I did when I had sepsis. And over the week, I was kept in hospital. I was attached to... They started me on a broad spectrum um, antibiotic first, intravenously. And it was just until they found the exact bacteria that I had. Okay. And then they put me on a, a more specific antibiotic. And, yeah, yeah, okay. and over that week, one of the saddest things, and one of the only times I cried actually, I don't cry that often unfortunately, because I think as men we're, we're less inclined to yeah. allow ourselves yeah. to be vulnerable. Yeah. And certainly with my background and my father leaving early, yeah. I found that, and growing up in Tala, yeah. vulnerability and, and uh, weakness are, are closely linked, yeah. 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 we would believe. I don't believe that anymore, but I would have seen a vulnerability as a weakness. Yeah. And that's the reason I don't cry that often, but my granny died when I was in hospital and I wasn't allowed to leave the hospital and it made sense. It actually, funnily enough, it was the first day I was allowed out of hospital in, in a week and they allowed me to go over to the local shop. Um, they did tell me not to go to the bar yeah. and I don't drink so I didn't go to the bar of course, but my granny died. And they didn't want me leaving the hospital and picking up maybe secondary infection in the nursing home. Yeah, exactly. So that was hard and I cried then and I allowed myself to be vulnerable for a few moments yeah, and then I sure. then I decided and I shouldn't have, looking back, I decided to to stop crying and, and man up essentially. Yeah. And yeah. and it's so wrong. Certainly with the, the level of, of male suicides and suicides generally, male and female, yeah. we need to be more expressive. And this yeah. is, it leads back into creativity and allowing us to express yeah. ourselves yeah. and be vulnerable yeah. and talk to people. So, so that year then continued on and I, I slowly but surely recovered. I, I was back in hospital every few weeks for scans and MRIs and CTs and PET scans and body checks. This month actually, January 2019 is the first month I've no hospital appointment since August of 2017. So it has been a, a tough road and it's, been, it's, it's tough on my friends and my family of course, my loved ones, the people close to me and on me yeah, as well, yeah. would I change it? I would for them, I, ch I would change it for them, would I change it for me? I don't think you would. No, I wouldn't. I think it's like bringing a whole new aspect I, here. I've, I've, my, my life was colourful as it was at yeah. the start, but I, I love my life and I, I have this driving, burning desire inside me too. To share my story with people yeah. and motivate people, life is so short. I almost died on several occasions. Yeah. This leads back to worry about cancer. I mean, a lot of people ask me, do I worry about melanoma coming back? And at stage three, the recurrence rates are really high. Okay. So it might come back. Yeah. I'm not going to worry about it because I could walk outside today and I could be knocked down. And I know we all say that, but it's true. It's very true. The yeah. only thing we know we have is this one moment. And for the people out watching, watching this, the only moment they have is the moment they're watching what? this. Yeah. Nothing else is guaranteed. Yeah. Nothing else is promised. So that's the feeling I have inside, is I want to share that, that message with people. Yeah. And really, before I was diagnosed, I always thought I knew that life was finite. Yeah. Secretly, I'm, I'm sure I thought I was going to live forever. Yeah. I was very yeah. proud of my health and my fitness yeah. and my body, and, and I looked after it. But I didn't realize, really, honestly, that life is so short. And have I achieved all my goals? And I haven't. Yeah. And why hadn't I? Because I was putting them off. Because I thought I was going to live forever. Yeah, yeah and I'll do it. I'll push it down the road. And, and tomorrow it. never comes. Yeah. You know. So, yeah. so that's what's driving me now. Yeah. Now I want to get into how you <laughs> and Eamon met. Okay. Okay. Wow. <laughs> get off the serious <laughs> stuff. <laughs> get get off the serious stuff. stuff. Okay. So, so when did you and Eamon meet? So this is going to be the difficult date question that a lot of or dates rather. Sorry, Eamon. Sorry, no, you're good. You're good. Um, dates rather, because a lot of people will ask me about the dates and times and how long I'm married and so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah, yeah. I am so bad at that. Um, actually, I'm not bad. I just I hate I hate doing that as well. I'm so bad because it, it kind of reinforces yeah, yeah, you to be yeah, bad. Yeah. Um, I just 
I just don't remember sometimes. So, Eamon and I met back in, what age am I now? I'm 35 now. I would have been 22 or 3, 22 maybe, so 13 or so years ago, whatever date that was, whatever year that was. Um, we met in a club called Reynards, which is now gone, a club in the city centre. Very cool nightclub um, that would have been uh, frequented by all of the, the great and good of, of, and bad of yeah. Irish society. And we met there and we hit it off. And shortly after that, Eamon was going through some things with um, some personal things in his life. His, his grandmother died and, and he was away a lot. His brother lives in America and his sisters now live there. They didn't know all that at that point. And his mum. Um, so he was busy with his family at that uh, at that point. So we we kind of lost contact a bit. Okay. And when his granny died, I knew how close they were. Mm. Um, actually, sorry, it was his granddad. His granny died just before I met him. Okay. And his granddad died, and I sent him uh, a card, and we linked back up after that. Yeah. And we went to Egypt for a holiday, and he always says, "You you came to Egypt and you never left." Um, because I I came back to the house which we now live in, very close to here. Yeah. And a house I absolutely in the love in a, yeah, in, a in a home that in an area that I absolutely love as well, and I never left, and I've been there ever since. Within two or three years, we were married in Vancouver. Obviously, yeah. um, same-sex marriage wasn't introduced in Ireland until yeah. 2015 or 2016. The referendum was 2015, and we got married in Vancouver. And that was however many years ago. I can't remember. I don't even know the date. It was either June or July, and it was the 12th or 13th. I do not know which. <laughs> I should know, but I don't. And I've seen it in a few interviews. So I'll just sort of take it back to the council for a second. Sure. But no one seems to ask you how aim and cope with that aspect of it. Yeah. I'm sure it's very hard for him. Like. Incredibly hard. And I think and, and no one... And he, f he discovered it before, didn't he? He no, did. It. Um, actually, I'll, I'll talk to you about the, the lucky process that went into me um, being diagnosed in a moment. But, yeah, I, I find Eamon and my mum and my brother and my sister, my immediate family, and also Eamon's siblings as well, were very close, and his mum. And, and his stepdad, who's my father-in-law, um, they all found it really hard, and my close friends. Yeah. Him more so, he's looking at me every day and he's seeing me as sick as I was. I think it's harder sometimes on the people around the patient. Yeah, 100%, yeah. Me as the patient in the eye of the storm, I knew how well I felt yeah. for most of, of the period, apart from the sepsis. Sep I was, when I had sepsis, I was the sickest I ever was. Yeah. But I felt really good around that, and what I promised all my family and friends was I was going to tell them everything, because I didn't want them finding something out and then uh, that I hadn't told them, yeah. and then them not believing that I was telling them everything forever again. Yeah. So I didn't want them to worry. So I promised I'd tell them everything, and it wasn't always easy. I was going in for scans. I was going in for PET scans. I was going in for, and no one knew why. And I was going in for MRIs. I was finding lumps. I was, I was. After my um, anaesthetics, I'd never had an anaesthetic, anything yeah. more than a, than a local ever before. Yeah. And I was finding for a period of a few weeks that if I'd stand up, even if I stood up now, I'd, I'd have to either immediately get on the ground or I'd collapse and yeah. pass out. Yeah. And no one knew if it was brain mets or no one knew what it was. So I had to have MRI scans after MRI scans. And that was incredibly worrying for my family and for Eamon. And, and he's looking at a future of, he's older than I am. Yeah. And the future, the natural kind of order of things, I suppose, and not, nothing follows that, but older people tend to die sooner, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and younger people don't. So he's looking at me, a person he knows for 14 or, or so years, or 13 or 14 years, really fit, really um, yeah. healthy, works out all the time. I'm at CrossFit, I'm horse riding, I'm, I'm going to the regular gym, I'm running, I'm swimming, I'm doing really highly active all of the time. And, and really in a, in a positive um, mind frame all of the time. Everything, I was never gonna get sick, so yeah. he was seeing this and it was yeah. a complete shock to his system. He still finds it hard. Um, Imagine, yeah. You know, my sister, back to my sister, we spoke about her earlier, and again, we have an incredible relationship, and I love her. Yeah. She's an amazing woman and an amazing sister, as my brother is as well. Um, but I, there was a period when I'd call her and she would be crying on the phone. A lot. She found it really difficult to, to manage and deal with. And my mum as well. My mum, 
in the, the space of a few months, she lost. She, I had gone through um, cancer diagnosis, a really serious cancer diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. She lost her mum, and then her sister, one of her sisters, was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was the first person ever in the whole family to be done. So the first gay in the family, at, at least as far as I know. Um, not saying nothing about anybody. Um, and then <laughs> I'm joking. There's no one out there. Though, I think. So and then exclusive. Uh, exclusive. There we go. Um, so it, there's no one in my family. I think is gay. I promise. Um, and then and it'd be cool if they were. So and then her sister got diagnosed with breast cancer very shortly after my diagnosis. Okay. So I was the first one. Actually, funnily enough. And this is back to me as a kid. I, I don't know. We may have touched on this a bit, and uh, we might get onto spirituality and beliefs. And, and um, but it's actually next. There was a, uh, all my life. I wanted a golden retriever, and this is just weird. Okay, um, she's the. I have two golden retrievers and a Bichon yeah. cross now. But Bess was my first golden retriever. I wanted her all my life. So much so that my mum never knew what any breed of dog. A dog is a dog. It has four legs. And no disrespect to her. She just didn't. Know. Dogs were dogs. You know. Yeah. And I wanted a golden retriever so much. She'd never seen one in her life. When we got Bess first, when we when we picked her up um, 11 years ago, we went to my mum's house to, to show to, to introduce them, and she actually said, "Is that a golden retriever?" The reason I'm saying that is because she knew I always wanted a golden retriever. So obviously, this dog yeah. had to be a golden yeah. retriever. And Bess was the dog of my dreams all my life. And when I got diagnosed with skin cancer, after I got out, yeah. I was rubbing Bess and she was lying on me and she, she's a lumpy dog and the breed tends to have lumps. Yeah. She had an unusual small lump, really small, like pea size on her yeah. uh, armpit, um, front left leg, and brought her to the vets and turns out she, within, she could have possibly had it at the same time as me, but a few months after my diagnosis, she was diagnosed with skin cancer. Mm with dog skin cancer, it's yeah. called a mast cell tumour, but she was diagnosed with skin cancer and she had to have the same surgery as me, a wide local excision to get all yeah. the skin from yeah. around it and the, the vet was talking about possibly a seroma which is uh, a build up of fluid in the space and yeah. he was trying to explain that to me after he tried to explain the wide local excision and I said you know what I just had one of those a few months yeah. ago, yeah, bizarrely. <laughs> And I said I had this aroma as well. I have the the, the fluid the fluid building up. So I said yeah. I know what it is, and I know what it is. Yeah. So that's just a, a bizarre um, kind of twist. But I know it led from from talking about my family and dealing with it to to that. But it's all kind of tied in, I guess. Um, and I I can appreciate from then a family member looking at a patient because I saw Beth. You sick, saw Beth, yeah. And she was incredibly sick, and it was around uh, March of. 2018 it would have been because she was incredibly sick for a while and it was St. Patrick's weekend and I remember being standing in the garden standing out in the garden with her wrapped up in snow snow and she was sick I had to bring her to UCD because she was there was so much going on she was yeah. incredible I, I was really worried for her yeah. so I I could I knew how my family were feeling looking at me yeah, yeah. because she is as close yeah. to me as as, as, family. as family she is my family 100%. so you touched on it there here spirituality mm -hmm. sure. and all that would, would you say you were very spiritual spiritual mm -hmm. before the cancer and, or do you think that just put it into you and you looked at more not before um well not immediately immediately before because i thought i knew it all um and i know nothing <laughs> none of the two yeah yeah growing up yes um, I found a book recently that I still have, and I'm so happy that I still have it. Yeah. I bought it when I was 15, and it was a book about creative visualization. Okay. And in the book, I wanted to be an artist, and I was circling any points in it that mentioned yeah. painting or art or creativity. That meant something to you. Oh, look, I yeah. was visualizing my, my future at yeah. that point yeah. of 15, so I had a belief in that. Yeah. Um, and back when I was 15, growing up in Tala, it wasn't easy to, to get books like this. I actually, yeah. you know, there was no internet, or if there was an internet, I certainly didn't have it in my house. There, my school only had one laptop, a oh, computer, yeah, yeah, you computer, know. Yeah, yeah. So I had no access to the internet. But I got this book from a, a, a shop, the sticker is still inside the book, a shop in Wakefield in the UK called Pentagram. Okay. So I, I'd love to know how I, I came across stuff like this. But I'm so glad that I did, and, and I was visualizing at that point. I mean, I was circling off anything that I wanted to be an artist. Yeah. And growing up in Tala, 
you know, drawing is cute and it's, yeah. it's nice and it's an, he's the good yeah. drawing friend that we have, yeah. but yeah. it's not a career path. And, and society in general would say someone growing up in a background like mine in, in Dublin 24 is is not supposed to dream and yeah. hope. And, and society would say that, yeah. greater society would say that, more so in the past and, and yeah. still now. Uh, now I feel like we need to take responsibility and say, you know what, we're individual people. Yeah. We're going to reach for our goals and our dreams because we can. If you buy growing up a good, yeah. anybody can. Yeah. And I suppose society would say, oh, you need to work in a factory or you need to work in a customer service job. And there's yeah. nothing wrong with those job reads. Absolutely not. And if that's something that you get fulfillment out of, that's 100% the fine. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I certainly don't judge anybody. Um, it just wasn't the, the path for me. So, so that at that point, my spirituality was was there. It was always there, and I was always incredibly interested. I remember vividly as a kid um, sitting in my grand grandparents' home in in Crumlin and watching the storming of the um, the Branch Davidian uh, compound in oh, Waco, yeah, yeah. Texas. Yeah. And uh, the Branch Davidians are uh, a religious sect, a Christian, a fundamental Christian religious sect. And they were they were led by a, a guy called Dave Koresh, or at least that was the name that he gave himself. Uh, it wasn't his birth name. And he was their spiritual leader. Yeah. And he spoke about the end days and fire and battles and the, the book of, of judgment or, or it's called in the Bible it's called the book of it's the final book in the Bible I can't believe I can't remember the name of it um, but um, he spoke about uh, the end of time and a battle a great battle being fought and the um, ATF and the SWAT team stormed the compound because they would had reports of stockpiling of, of weapons and child abuse yeah. and what ended up happening was the compound was burned down to the ground. A lot of people lost their lives, and I was I was eating it up. And I, I didn't want to go and join the Branch Davidians at all, but I was so interested in why people were following a person like Dave Koresh, and, and I was also interested in other cults like Heaven's Gate, um, where people that, that was a that was a UFO type cult, yeah. and they thought that um, they were going to be if they they took their own lives they were going to go to to a spaceship that was behind a comet that was yeah. in the sky at that point and um, there were other cults out there as well of course like the moonies and, and uh, various different sects and everything's a cult anything any group of people that follow a leader the catholic church is, is arguably a cult yeah but i was incredibly interested in stuff like that and i I, d I became a Freemason, and, and this is not connected. Freemasonry is not of mystical, and magical, and not holy, yeah. and there's no yeah. hidden, hidden anything in Freemasonry. Really, what Freemasonry is is a group of guys that get together, and it's like, it, and it's it's a good a bunch of guys who come together. It's like teamwork. It's it's, yeah. a, it's a community of, of men who come together and hang out, um, and do a lot of really good charity work, yeah. and, and donate all of the all of the money they make to charities. But one of the requirements to be a Freemason is you have to have a belief in a supreme being. Yeah. So that's where I'm, I'm linking uh, Freemasonry into it because I was a Freemason at a point that I decided that I decided that I knew better and I knew I became an atheist. Mm. Uh, nothing wrong with being an atheist, and I'm not saying uh, you know I'm not judging anybody. Yeah. Uh, it's not my job to judge anybody. I wouldn't expect anybody yeah. to judge me. Um, it's just. I decided for whatever reason that I was an atheist, so I had to resign from Lodge, from Freemasonry, because you have to have a belief in a supreme being. And then I was I was an atheist throughout my surgeries and my, my cancer story. And I remember vividly going into to surgery and, and there are two Marys who work in pre and post op in, in St. Vincent's in, in um, uh, Dublin 4, St. Vincent's University Hospital of the Public uh, side of and I had a, a band on my left arm, and it was a Kabbalah band, uh, or Kabbalah. And the Kabbalah is not a very mystical um, yeah. religion. Is probably the wrong word. It's a it's, it's a form of, of uh, mysticism that the people follow, closely linked to yeah. Judaism, but not Judaism. Yeah. Um, and I had a, 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 the, the band that, that is there to, to protect you on yeah. my left hand. I, I can hear people already saying, oh, well, you had that well on you, it didn't yeah, protect yeah, you very yeah, well. Yeah, I think yeah. it did, actually. Um, and I'll, I'll link that in, in a moment as to how my melanoma yeah. was, was spotted and 
I was found at an early enough stage rather than it developing into a stage yes. 4 cancer. So Mary said, we, she and I were speaking about um, what the band was and she wanted to take it off before I went in. So it didn't end up coming off and ending up inside it, I guess. And I said, oh, it's a kebab, a bracelet. And she said, oh, you're religious. And, and I said, actually, no, I'm an atheist. And she said, oh, and we had a conversation about that yeah. before I went into surgery. And then when I came out of surgery and after quite a period, I was still an atheist and I wasn't questioning my beliefs at all. Mm. And then I, I suppose I had what people would call, well, I suppose I had a spiritual, a spiritual reawakening. Yeah. But, and not in a woo-woo kind of way. Um, and not in a, although there's nothing wrong with, with people being woo-woo at all. It's just not my, me, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I might find myself being there because I don't know what I believe. I'm yeah. challenging it all of the time. But my, my beliefs changed. Uh, and it, I feel like inside of me, I had a, the, the spiritual reawakening, but also I'd gone through what's known as the dark night of the soul, which is, is like a, a really difficult period in your life that that is there to, to guide you and lead you in, in a certain direction. Look, I, d I don't know how the cancer happened, what happened, is it environmental, is it something outside of me, I don't know. I, I, uh, it's a much broader conversation for that because a lot of people, I don't want to, I don't want to, I, look, it's not something I, can, I want to get into at the moment, I suppose. Um, because some people have different ideas and yeah. thoughts and, and I don't want to... Yeah, well, that's fine. Um, but um, the spirituality, I suppose, came from there and, and it came back into my life. And I'm searching for answers everywhere. And I was interviewing a guest on a podcast recently and what I said was, I feel like I'm in the middle of a forest. And it's not a dark forest. I feel like I'm in the center of a forest and there are blasts of lightning in from everywhere okay. and there, each one of them can lead me in a direction I just don't know which one to grasp onto there's so much information and, and there's so much happening and, and going on and, and I'm, I'm just so excited that I have I'm alive and I can I can look into it and, and try to find out yeah. where the path is, is leading cool. um, so the last question I have for you okay. what are your plans for the future EG is there an art exhibition coming up or sure. Your podcast is that hopefully going to go somewhere? Well, I'm going to lean down to that in a moment. And, and sorry, I don't usually do this for interviews, but what this is an important message for people if you've any lumps or bumps or any moments oh, yeah, in your body that change, um, go to your, your GP. There's, there's no harm in going to your GP. I mean, if I'd gone earlier, and again, back to the start of this interview, I said I wouldn't change any of what happened yeah. to me, I would only change it because of the effect it had on my family, family and friends. Yeah. And friends. But there's no harm in going to your GP if anything on your skin is changing or anything, if you have any lumps at all, it's worth it for peace of mind. The reason I was, well, I consider myself lucky when I spoke about the band um, doing its yeah, job, I yeah. think, is because my husband had been on at me for quite a while about being checked. Um, I I put it off because I thought I knew better and I thought as a, a men and women do it as well but yeah. you know we think we're super healthy and we're never going to get sick I let my health insurance lapse because I never had any more than a cold in my whole life mm. and I thought I knew better and only for my, my sister-in-law at a wedding she doesn't live in Ireland she happened to be here for the wedding she persuaded me to make a phone call to, to uh, a friend of mine actually well, I didn't call them, I called the place about getting mole mapped and it turns out mole mapping isn't quite, uh, they're not professional dermatologists, they're just checking your moles and a year later they'll see if they've changed. You really need to see a GP or a, a, someone who is a, is a professional and a dermatologist, absolutely. Um, certainly if you have any changes at all. I texted a friend of mine who's a GP um, and I said, who would you recommend as a specialist that I go and see for a mole that might be changed in my back? And it's bleeding a little bit, but it's friction from my waistband, from my yeah. train, which is what I thought. Um, yeah. I, to I told myself. And he said, come up and see me. I'm, I'm just up the road. I'm off with the kids today. I have a day off. And I actually texted him back and I said, no, no, you're fine. I don't have to come up and see you. It's not fair. You're my pal. Yeah. Um, you're with your kids. I don't want to impose. I'm fine. I'm not, I'm not sick. There's nothing wrong. And he said, no, seriously, come up to see me. And only for him persuading me to go up. Because 
it was coming up to Christmas. I was due to go to LA for Christmas, and I would have been sunbathing online. But it, you know, when I go to LA, what I used to do in the past was after a CrossFit class in the morning, I'd go for a run up Hollywood Boulevard. I'd run, then I'd link onto Sunset Boulevard, and I'd run up to the end, and I'd I'd go to the the gym then after a CrossFit class in my my mother-in-law's apartment complex, and I. I'd be burning while I, I yeah. I'd be running, you know, in, in even early morning sunshine in LA is, is is hot in Hollywood. I would have done that. So that on top that those few months on top of a, sta a, a stage three cancer yeah. could have it could have changed my life. But I may not be sitting here. Yeah. So I was very lucky in a way that um, uh, my my friend who's the GP referred me to hospital and then the ball started rolling. Yeah. September 11th came around, Friday the 13th came around of November, October, and very lucky in that regard. So if anyone out there has anything on their skin, go and get it checked. It could save your life. Or if anyone you know has something on their skin, go and have it checked. It, it's worth it for peace of mind, and again, it could save your friends and family going through what I went through and mine went through, and it could save a life. But, but to your question then, I guess, about what what is my future um, ahead of me and what are my goals, essentially. I think goal setting is incredibly important as well, by the way. And imagine it like a, an airplane flying in the sky that has no destination, has no goal. Yeah. It's just going to fly around until it runs out of, of energy. It might land anywhere. Yeah. You don't want to land anywhere in your life. You want to land in your, at your goal. You might be halfway to your goal and you might decide you have a different goal. That's fine. Yeah. You can divert. Have a goal in mind and a direction you're going in and take control of your life. Yeah. So for me, I have been inspired, and I spoke about this earlier, that I, I feel so much motivation and inspiration in me that I've never felt before in my life yeah. that I want to share my story with people. Yeah. So I have a podcast series called the Stephen Farrell Podcast, Stephen with a V. And what I do is I have some well-known guests and I have some not so well-known guests. And what we talk about is what inspires them, motivates them, how they overcame any difficulties in their lives, and we give some tips and tools. Um, so, you know, I certainly didn't realize, well, I didn't know how strong I was um, in terms of overcoming the, the difficulty I had in terms of cancer. Um, I suppose I learned a lot of that when I was a kid, growing up when my father left, but we don't realize that there are people out there who don't know how to get out of the rut that they're stuck in or to overcome the difficulties that they have in their lives. So any pointers and any tips, and one of my guests might might give a great tip to you, but someone else might get something from one of the other guests. Yeah. I actually had a, a, a very well-known movie star, Colin Farrell, on a, a few days ago, and we didn't cover acting at all, or at least we, we skimmed the surface of acting. Yeah. That was not why I wanted him on the, the podcast. The reason I wanted him on is because he's incredibly intelligent, he's incredibly deep, I value his opinion, yeah. and what we spoke about was vulnerability and creativity yeah. and, and fear and shame and all of the things that we all suffer from. And we need to acknowledge that yeah. and address it and, and and believe in ourselves and we don't do that enough so so part of my my future goal is for however long i live and hopefully it's a very long life yeah. is to use my art and my story and help to inspire and motivate people to live the best life they can live yeah. and and to believe in themselves and to aspire to their goals and their dreams no matter where they're from if this kid who grew up in dublin 24 in a society that would have told me i should have been working in a in a a factory, a factory or in a job that, that I, I wouldn't have got fulfillment for. If I could do it with the background I had, anyone can do it. There's nothing stopping anyone. The only thing that's stopping us is, is what's up here in our self-talk and how we talk to ourselves. Well, Stephen, that's all I have for you. <laughs> Thanks again for doing it. Thank you so much. I, I loved it. The fourth guest. <laughs> the guest. Fourth Thank the you. I appreciate that. That's all. Well, well done. Thanks very much. Right. Thank you. Good man. Now everyone, I hope you all enjoyed that. There's plenty more to come. And if you like it, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. There's plenty more to come and subscribe to yeah, Stephen's mailing list for his podcast. Yeah, Brian's got to put some links in the show notes and like some of his other videos and subscribe to them as well. Have a great day and thank you for pressing play.